got a great Emma Lops meet up for you. And that is our intro. <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Excited to be here. <laughs> there we go. I don't think you're going to get an intro quite like that at uh, any other meetup that you go yeah, to. I can't tell you the last time I've been serenaded, so I appreciate it. <laughs> All right, let's 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 get real. Let's get started. It looks like we got people here. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. In the, in the house, we have David. As you know, he is coming here for a little chat today, and we're going to be talking about some great stuff. I'm excited about how we're doing this. But first, before we even jump into anything, you know I got the announcements to make. First one is, if you're not in Slack, what are you doing? Get in it. Get in our Slack channel. You will not hear more of me serenading you, but you will have lots of stimulating conversations happening and all kinds of good questions that are being answered when it comes to the whole MLOps universe, we could say. So hopefully you can jump in it. We have the invite link. I hope it's not, Chris, I, I just want to mention that one of the invite links is broken. Hopefully this is not the broken one. A lot of people have been complaining about that one because we pasted the invite link all over the internet and Slack said, this invite link will never expire. And then it expired. Now, I know we could, I could just play guitar and we could actually sing this whole meetup, but... David, I think you got a lot of good stuff that you want to tell us. And I don't know how well your voice intones over the internet, I'm sure. You don't want it, I promise. <laughs> uh, so, man, it's great to have you here. I think everybody heard the intro, but if they don't know who you are, you've got some street cred. You're working at Determined AI. And today we are going to be talking about moving deep learning from research to production with Determined AI and Kubeflow. Anytime that we talk about Kubeflow, people get really excited. I want to, uh, I want to start, before we talk about any of that, where I normally start from, and just give us a breakdown. How did you get into tech? Yeah, uh, I took a ride. I ended up so I started doing aerospace engineering because I liked airplanes, still do. Uh, that was my undergrad. But I ended up doing, just like writing code the whole time I was doing aerospace engineering. Uh, and at some point I realized I liked the code more than the aerospace engineering. So I uh, ended up following that along a path to machine learning. Uh, at the time, still out of interest in, in seeing if we could make uh, planes that fly themselves better. But uh, then I steered just to machine learning was my passion. And uh, Love it. I mean, I got into the space at Ford and had an awesome job there working in the deep learning space uh, on just like a huge wide range of applications. Was really lucky to, to be able to touch a lot of different things and had a lot of freedom to really like learn and grow different types of models. Um, and through that, just ended up focusing a ton of time on the infrastructure supporting machine learning. So uh, just found out how much there is and how much need there is, which, I, which is why this community exists. Mm -hmm. uh, and started chipping out problems one by one there and ran into determined in the process of that and ended up here. But uh, yeah, so it's been, a, it's been a path. I sort of been following the winds where they've taken me through this, but uh, I am pretty happy with where I'm at now. So cool. So let's, here's how I, kind of structured the next hour in my head and you tell me if this works for you. I wanted to talk about what Determined AI is real fast, just so everyone right. can have a bit of a background. I wanted to talk about a little bit about Kubeflow and what that's doing and just general chatting on Kubeflow. Then talk about how these two worlds collide, Kubeflow and Determined. And then the idea of research machine learning to production. Yep. And if we have any time at the end, just some general questions, whoever is with us right now, feel free to ask any questions you have in the chat. 
or throw them in the Q and A section. Or if you're really feeling lucky or like you want to get involved, you can unmute yourself and ask away. So I'll try and be a little bit um, on top of my game to make sure if anybody wants to ask anything, you can, and you can just raise your hand and then I'll let you go for it. So let's start with determined AI. And can you just give us a breakdown of what it is? Yeah, uh, so Determined is a open source deep learning training platform. So uh, unpacking that a little bit, when we talk about deep learning training, I mean, what we focus on is really uh, the experience around building and training models. And so we provide a handful of tools to make that process a lot easier uh, and also let teams and just data scientists scale up what they're capable of when they train models. And so uh, when you install Determined, the first thing you do is it, it installs on some sort of compute cluster. That cluster can be your laptop. It can be a, a GPU box you got somewhere. It can be a, a large scale, you know, hundreds and hundreds of GPUs. Um, and then you start describing, you know, you write machine learning models the same way you had before, PyTorch, TensorFlow, you know, uh, where people are comfortable. And then uh, Determined will take that and you can do things like just run training. Uh, you can run distributed training. We make it really easy to scale up to large scale distributed training. Uh, we have tools for hyperparameter search uh, based on the ASHA algorithm that was uh, invented by one of our co-founders. Um, and you know, all of those come together to make it really easy to take models and train them more efficiently, train them faster, train them better. Uh, and all the while keep track of the work you're doing and um, and all that kind of thing. So I've got some uh, some demo materials available for this whole talk that we can get into. So I'll be able to show it to you in a minute. But uh, sweet, yeah, sweet. So let's just uh, let's focus on this because I know a lot of times it gets a bit murky when people want to compare tools. So yeah, can yeah. you give us an idea of how Determined AI is different than some? more standard artifact storage like ML flow is the first yeah. one that comes to mind, right? Yep. Uh, so that's a great comparison. And I guess I, I'll start by saying up front, one the other piece of being a training platform is just like, we don't really mess in the data space. We're not really talking like Pachyderm or friends of us that work upstream, that kind of thing, right? Um, and then downstream, we don't really do the, the inference space very much. So we're not hosting models, we're not serving models like Selden, we're not doing batch inference, we're not a Spark provider, that sort of stuff, right? So really in training. And then, you know, comparing ourselves to something like MLflow is a good comparison. Or, or you can think of something like weights and biases, I think is similar in that space that, that let you track artifacts and uh, track your training and things like that. Um, they are both tools to get a little bit technical that give you like APIs that you add to your code. You say, track this metric, test this metric, track this artifact, then they all get uploaded to some server somewhere and track it, right? And so you just run your training code with them and then they track this that stuff. Uh, and some of those tools also provide utilities to actually run your code. Um, Determined is a slightly more holistic solution in the training space. Uh, we get a little bit more intimate with your code. We ask, you know, what is your model? What is your optimizer? What is your, you know, how are you loading data? And then we end up um, taking that and actually, you know, optimizing it for the cluster for you, uh, letting you run sophisticated experiments without you having to rewire things. And so, and also I should say the artifact tracking, the metric tracking, keeping track of what hyperparameters you're using, that stuff all just sort of falls out when you tell us all that stuff. So. We're the ones that actually, you know, say train the model for some number of steps, but then we track all the artifacts associated with that automatically. Um, and it's not, you don't need to add in extra tracking and stuff like that. We just, that all falls out of working with Determine. Nice. So one question that I think is good to note too, is like, where are the boundaries between what your tool Determined AI does really well and where it works smoothly with other things around it? Yeah. Because, um, so the, the, sorry, just to preface this a little bit, I know that right now with like DVC came out with a few months ago now with like 1.0, right? And mm -hmm. some people were asking in Slack, 
how it seems like you're moving into ML flow territory. Is it worth it to use both of these or should I just choose one or the other? And so I'm wondering like, how do you, do you balance that situation? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think you could use MLflow and determine, like you could add all those API calls in. I, I think you'd find out it was pretty redundant once you got there though. Um, by the point where you're training your models with determine, all the stuff that you would want to track in MLflow is automatically going to be tracked for you and determined and you're going to be able to see it. So you know, while you could interface MLflow and determine, I think ML, like determine is really a pretty overlapping solution. Um, and I'd be surprised if that was something that you ended up actually wanting to do once you got there. Hmm. Um, you know, on the other ends, I think there's a lot of clean room for integrations and that's some of the stuff we're going to talk about today. Uh, whether it's an inferencing system, we provide, you know, API level access to the results of training so that you can grab, you know, a model that you train and determine and instantiate it for whatever kind of inference you want to do. Right. Um, and so that's like a really smooth transition to some downstream piece, which is making it super, super easy to take the results of a training run and use that in inference somewhere. Um, and similarly upstream, you know, most people are getting their data to their models just writing Python code and we don't really get in the way of that. So whatever tools you're using, be it DBC or Pachyderm, um, we have good examples where you can, you know, specify things like data set versions in a config file while you're training a model. And then that all gets tracked with it or alongside all the other metrics that you were tracking and determined so you can keep track of data stuff. But we, we aren't versioning providers. We just you know, make it easy to uh, interface with those versioning providers. Mm -hmm. So let's move on to Kubeflow. Cool. And there was a great thread that came up the other day in the questions answers part of Slack. And it was saying, is Kubeflow dying? And I want to know your take on it. Yeah, uh, Kubeflow, I think, and I've only interfaced with that community a handful, I should say, up front. But from my perspective, I think it suffers a little bit because of how many, like, they manage that project to some extent. Like, it's a whole bunch of managed or like individual projects. And some of them have grown and flourished and continue to grow and flourish and thrive. Uh, in particular, like I am a huge fan of Kubeflow pipelines. I think they've done an incredible job of bringing workflow management to, to Python and machine learning. Um, I think that's an interface that ML people can inter like can work with and understand and, and it makes sense to them. They're writing Python to do it. Uh, that's an awesome component. Uh, and other components that are mature, things like TF job and the MPI job, like those are really good bloating blocks. And they solved the problem at the beginning of just like, how can we actually run machine learning on Kubeflow, right? That said, there are other components that like have some ups and downs. Um, I have like, I, I never want to bash on things because there's a lot of good work, but like things like Katib is like kind of tricky to use. Like I've never had a particularly good experience using their hyperparameter tuning. Um, but it's just, so that's a long winded way to say, I don't think it's dying. I think that there are, are excellent components. I think they come along at different paces. I think if you find yourself in a hole of trying to get Katib to work, you might say like, what is this Kubeflow thing? Um, when in reality, there's, you know, awesome work being done on stuff like pipelines that make it a really sweet tool. So great answer. So anybody that's listening, if you have any strong thoughts on that, throw it in the chat or throw it in the comments, because I love hearing about Kubeflow. I think it's just such a beast, like we know, and there are so many different components and some parts are flourishing, some parts not so much. Uh, and it's, it's Great to hear your take on it. What are some of the things that you hope for as far as a future with determined AI and Kubeflow? Like, how do you see the, those two becoming more solidified? Yeah, so I think it's important to address up front that there's overlap between determined and some of the components of Kubeflow. Uh, so, you know, in terms of running, training, you know, we are very similar in that concept to like your MPI job, your uh, your TF job, whatever it may be. Um, we let you run, you know, models, train models, distributed, that sort of thing in, in Kubernetes. You know, we announced Kubernetes support last week. Um, and so very similar overlap there. I would say like the thing that I think Determined does a lot better is bringing that to a data scientist level. Um, if you're just a data scientist and you install Kubeflow, you're going to run into like having to learn Kubernetes, which um, 
I've been through that process before, but I don't recommend it to most people. <laughs> it's not a very fun thing to have to learn just for the sake of training models. Um, mm. And similarly, Katib, you know, that's another piece where we provide hyperparameter tuning. Um, and, you know, I think, frankly, we do a better job of it. Um, and so th there are pieces that we overlap with, is so, what I'm getting at. So um, when, go for it. Oh, sorry. Uh, if you wanted to finish that, feel free. Yeah, I'll wrap up real fast. That said, I think plugging into some of the excellent things they have, uh, pipelines, like getting more intimate with that, providing better APIs so that you can instantiate determined runs, um, and just you know, building, making it as easy as possible to use tools like pipelines and use their serving tool, like deploy models. Um, I think there are really clean interfaces that we could build that would make it so that by as soon as you write a model in determined, it's ready for serving in something like Selden, for instance, right? And that's uh, that's really cool. I would I want to explore and make that a better integration. Yeah, that does sound very nice. So let's talk about that. We we jumped ahead a little bit mm -hmm. for what your vision for the future is, but let's talk about where it's at right now and how does determined interact with Kubeflow at the moment? Yeah. Uh, Got some demo material I'd be happy to show off, but um, right now, you know, there's a couple different ways. Um, the first is something like Kubeflow pipelines. We've got API level access. And when you, anytime you think of a workflow management um, solution, I think of, you know, like what APIs can it call to do really cool things, right? And so uh, by providing clean APIs to do things like take a model from a GitHub repository and do distributed training, right? With determined, right? And so now, you can set up Kubeflow pipelines that can trigger distributed training jobs in Determined. And if they're running weekly, now, now all of a sudden you have a solution for retraining. You know, new data comes in every week, you need to retrain a model using a Kubeflow pipeline. Determined provides the right APIs to be able to programmatically do that um, and, and do it at scale or do high parameter tuning, that kind of thing, right? So that, that's one piece is just like, by being an API provider for pipelines, you can do really, really cool things. Um, another side is something, as I said, like serving, uh, we provide tools and this is again, API contracts where you can, uh, we have a model registry. So you say, you know, I'm naming this model. This is my question answering model. Um, you can upgrade that model. You can maintain versions of that model. Uh, but then we have an API contract. So downstream, if you have a serving solution, um, it, it can, you know, you can quickly push out and say, update to a new version of this model, and it will hook in, ask determined for that model, load that model from determined and instantiate it. And you can use it without having to rewrite anything. You just say bump a version, you know, and, um, you know, those are both, I think, clean, clean things already that you can do combining those tools. So as far as. Like, let's say I want to find out which model has been trained and what type of models they are. Is the Kubeflow metadata the way to go for that one? And determine, does Determined have a way to record this metadata? Yeah, Determined is, frankly, I think, a much easier solution than, than Kubeflow for tracking that metadata. Um, when you train a model or say something in the model registry, um, the whole history of that training is tagged along with it. So every metric, loss curves, evaluation metrics is tracked, what hyperparameters you used, what machines it trained on, when it happened, the state of the code when you trained it. Um, you know, if you're using a data versioning provider, like what version of the data you used, like all of that is automatically tracked. It's tagged along with the models. You can access it via API. It's like, it's all, it's all there. And so, um, Whereas in Kubeflow, you might need to engineer your own solution to snapshot this stuff, um, to upload metrics to S3 or wherever you may be storing things, right? Uh, and determine when you train a model, when you version a model, uh, that stuff is you know, frozen and accessible at all times. So let's just take a step back, because since we are chatting a little bit about model registries, can mm -hmm. you talk to us about what a model registry is and why it's so important to have that? Heck yeah. Um, so it, it sounds almost dumb when you talk about a model registry, like, but there's this like actual core difficult problem of I built this model. I was doing research. I'm trying 
tons of different hyperparameters. I'm modifying the model every five minutes. I'm kicking off all these jobs. Um, I get to this point where I think this is a good model, right? And then I want to use that in production somewhere, right? A lot of times the people bring into production is a completely different team. Um, like you have an ML engineering team or an ML ops team or whatever it may be. And so suddenly you need to coordinate, like, how do I physically, how do I hand off this model to this other team? And there's a lot that goes into it. It's the actual version of the code to instantiate the model. It's the right set of weights. You probably want some way to track metadata associated with it in case there are scores to be able to interact programmatically. Um, and so like, at its core, this suddenly goes from like what sounds like it should be a pretty easy problem to like I'm spending weeks and meetings and emails trying to like physically figure out and help this person instantiate my model and load my weights. And so instead of training new models or working on this, now your researcher is spending time all day with the ML engineering team getting this figured out. And then it gets worse because you try to then build a new version of the model. And instead of just like that person being able to grab the new version, um, they have to go through this whole stupid cycle again of get the weights, figure out where to host them, where do I put it, how do I instantiate the new version, is it the same, is there a new environment? Like, it's a pain, right? And so what the model registry comes in and does is just basically provide a clean interface for that handoff. When you train your model and determined, as I said, everything gets tracked, right? Your, the code that creates the model, the weights, uh, metadata, all of that, right? And so by saving it to the model registry, now you can say to your ML engineering team, uh, to get my model, my model is called question answering, ask determine for that model. It doesn't just tell you where the stuff is, but it will actually like instantiate that model for you. And so you can use it in a downstream system. Caveats, it's Python based right now. Like we don't have connectors to plug into your C++ solutions and whatever it may be, right? Um, but at least for, some simple things like running uh, pipelines or batch inference or, or serving solutions like Selden. It's, you know, you call an API, ask for a question answering model and you get it and instantiate it and you can get a version of it. Um, and you don't need this whole horrible handshake of how to do it. Hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. That seems like it will make life a lot easier too. Yeah. And it's one of those things that we talk about a lot here, how back in the day, the whole reason that DevOps came to be, right, was you don't want to throw something over the fence and have two teams taking care of something yeah. when it can be merged into one. And so I understand that's a little bit of what you're trying to do there is make sure that it's not this whole process to get these models out there yeah. and start serving them as quickly as possible, which I think is really what it feels like so many different companies right now are trying to do in this space is the pain is very clear for us, right? The pain is that it's taken too long to get the models out there. Like, I can't tell you how many people I've talked to on this meetup that that is what they're trying to figure out how to make the pain, yeah. that time, break it from six months to two weeks or however long, even from two weeks to just, you know, a, a few minutes. So let's let's go into what you wanted to show us can you give us the quick okay. demo real fast and then uh if i don't know how long you budgeted for the demo hopefully we can talk a bit about the whole idea of getting from research to to production also Heck yeah uh yeah i can do it pretty quick i think i should be able to fire it off sweet sweet Perfect. let's do it all right so um I just want to start with, with this exact story we were just telling. So, right, this is my version of what without the tools you doing research kind of looks like. You build your BERT squad model for a question answering uh, in PyTorch, or actually I'm using hugging face here, right? Um, you write a model, you can train it, you write out metrics, all that cool stuff, right? Um, and as you go, like you can train models, you can see good results, but you're going to run into a handful of things. So, um, you know, I trained a cool model. It's getting decent scores. Uh, I can test it. I can, you know, ask some trivial things, run against it, see what's going on. Um, maybe I can tweak some hyperparameters, train again, you know, like iterate on this thing, uh, eventually come up with a good model. Um, and, 
this is going to work okay for you, but you're going to just get stuck. So things like, um, you know, I'm saving checkpoints to this checkpoints directory, but I probably actually want to name those checkpoints something that has to do with the hyperparameters. And then I somehow also want to log the metrics alongside of them and all that. And so the first thing that comes up is you just, you need some way, if you ever have any hope of going to production to keep track at a real core level of your work. And so you use something like ML flow, weights and biases, determined, whatever it may be, right? And, and you need some way, to, you, like, you finally can keep track of this. And so, uh, you know, for this talk, let's talk about determined. Um, and I'm just gonna jump to, you know, doing this exact same thing in determined. So um, I promised you before, determined runs very similarly. Uh, once again, we write a hugging face squad uh, model and uh, kick this off and determined. And now we end up with something that looks a little bit more like this. So um, it's gonna do the same thing. It's gonna train that same model, fixed hyperparameters for a while. Um, but when you run into determined, you have really comprehensive tracking of what's going on. So you have your model code, it's tracked. Uh, you can see where your checkpoints are being stored and have clean access to that. Uh, you can look at what hyperparameters were used to train this model. You have all of the curves you care about, whether it's your F1 score or just, um, you know, whatever it may be, your metrics. Uh, and so this is the first step to production is like, I actually have a log of stuff. I know where this model is. I can use it. Like I have a clear history of all the work I was doing. Um, and, and so now you can do things such as say, you know, this was called, or this was experiment two and determined. Uh, we can ask determined to get experiment two, grab the check top checkpoint, load that model, and we can use it to do, um, you know, inference. And so, you know, I say this to say, instead of having to keep track and messily work on your checkpoint code and keep a spreadsheet of all the metrics and all of that, um, you know, now you have a solution to cleanly keep track of all of the work you're doing. Um, and you know, do inference in some sort of programmatic way instead of some ad hoc way where you're taking these models in notebooks and, and tossing them around. Um, so the cool part about this though is it's not just, you know, as I said, it's not just models that you pass around and, and ad hoc instantiate. We're giving you a programmatic way to do it. And so what that means is suddenly you can do things like build scripts to do inference um, from some specific version of a model. So the other thing that Determine provides, as I said before, is this registry. And so suddenly we can build a script that says, um, if I've got data in some path, take grab some model from Determine, Determine is located here, grab some version of the model. And then what's gonna do is actually like loop over that data and, and score. So this is a really, standard batch inference script, right? But instead of having to ad hoc figure out how to do the code and, and upload my model to S3 somewhere and then someone else downloads it somewhere, um, I have clean APIs, same ones I was using here to do it. Um, and if you're familiar with Qflow pipelines at all, like if you have a script that operates on some inputs from argparse and then creates outputs, uh, you've got a one step jump to say, run this kind of thing in Kubeflow. And so if we jump to Kubeflow, um, we can, this is my like boring version of this pipeline. And so what it's gonna do is create a shared volume, download some data from S3 to that volume, and then just call that script on that data, right? Um, and if we tell it, you know, where determined is similarly, uh, the name of the model we want, some version of the model, uh, I have two versions here, and where the data is, suddenly you're talking about kicking off a script that, you know, and, and with Kubeflow, you can do this like run uh, programmatically, you can trigger it from some trigger, you can run it ad hoc, you can run it on some timeline, right? Um, but, you know, it's coordinating a really reproducible way to do this as your model versions iterate, you know, all you're looking at is uh, popping in a new version here. So if you've got someone on your research team iterating, creating better models, it's really easy to still use the same exact code to uh, do inference. And you know, this experience is not the 
ad hoc collaboration, but you have this real clean dividing line between someone that's working in determined doing, you know, modeling, but maybe they can go and also kick off some, you know, hyperparameter search to improve their model. They're doing all of the research stuff that they want to do to, to iterate on this model, make it better, try new data sets, try new models. Um, and then behind the scenes, the, you know, ops team can take that and easily create scalable ways to do batch inference, right? Uh, and so this is really the core of what I wanted to show off today is just like, this is a clean, easy handoff to have your research over here and determined you get to do really cool stuff. You get to scale up to cluster scale and train models fast and easy. Um, but with the right APIs, you can uh, make scalable ways to then do that in Kubeflow, something like that for inference. Looks like a match made in heaven. <laughs> Happy to answer questions about this too. I know we flew through that, but I have, uh, we can dive into any code here too if people are curious about it. Yeah, for sure. If anyone has anything that they want to say, throw it in the chat. Um, I am seeing one from before that was asked, and it was Airflow versus Luigi versus Argo versus MLflow versus Kubeflow. Which orchestration tool to use when? Great. Yeah, yeah, it is a good question. Um, I have worked with a bunch of them. I have examples in one of our determined repositories for working with Airflow and Argo and Kubeflow pipelines. Um, I, I've heard of something called Cooler that I'm thinking about building a uh, example with later this week that is meta over all of those. Um, I think they serve similar roles. The thing I like about Kubeflow pipelines is, uh, and we can actually look at it, the way you declared Kubeflow pipelines is just with Python. Like, at least that's one of the ways you can do it. And I just think it feels a lot more natural for a data scientist to be able, like, at my core, that's what I like to do, right? I want to write more Python code and I want to write less, like, long YAML files that describe what I want to do. Airflow is the same, but uh, I think the execution standard is a little bit cleaner when Kubeflow. Um, Airflow has a lot of plugins for doing like data transformation and stuff like that, whereas Kubeflow is a bit more geared towards running, you know, machine learning training type jobs. So, yeah. So another question is coming through here in the chat, and it's asking when using Kubeflow or Determined, how can you deploy the model through CD tools like Jenkins? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, I, I've looked into this for a couple of different ways. Um, or, or like even Argo has a CD, there's something called Argo CD that I've used before. Uh, one option is to have these Kubeflow pipelines get kicked off by, by some sort of uh, CD tool like Jenkins, right? So you push new code, um, say it's a new version of this pipeline or something like that, it kicks off this pipeline. And I have another example here, um, which we didn't touch at all, but it's something like, um, you know, this is a pipeline that grabs a model from GitHub, trains the model, checks if it's better than the previous version of the model, and if it's better, it deploys it with Selden, right? And so this is exactly what you're saying. Say you push new, a new version of model code to some repository, say you push a new data set to some place, say you push uh, new deployment code, right? Suddenly you can use your, your Jenkins uh, or whatever you may be using for CD to uh, trigger this pipeline, run all of this stuff and push that new model to deployment. And, um, you know, I think that is a feasible step to actually delivering some sort of CD or CI CD to this, uh, to machine learning, which has <laughs> always been kind of hard for, for a lot of people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So there's another question. It's, um, Yardim's asking in the chat, how is determined connected to Kubeflow? Good question. So um, in this specific case, the uh, batch inference, uh, there's, you know, this Kubeflow pipeline is just running these steps. This step is actually calling those determined APIs. It's in fact, this step is this exact script that I had open here um, that just says, reach out to determined, get the model called question answering, get version two of that model, it then you know loads and instantiates it, uh, and then you can use it. And so, you know, when you when you think about a pipeline like this, all it's really doing is we wrote a script that tells Kubeflow how to talk to Determined, load a model, 
and use that model for batch inference on some data set. Um, and you know, to some extent, all integrations in software are just good APIs. Um, and that's what I, I think we've put out here. All right, Mr. Researcher. Are we gonna talk about a little bit of this now? Let's, let's get into, I know that you've done some research with deep learning and I read up on your website <laughs> where you talked about how you're a photographer and you also talked about some Atari game that you put some deep learning to. Was that it? Did I get that correct? Or was it just a random game? Uh, yeah, it was back in, uh, back in grad school, actually. I did some work. There's a paper uh, called Feudal Networks for Hierarchical Reinforcement Learning that Google put out. Uh, awesome paper. Great concept. Um, and so I, I put a lot of work into trying to replicate that paper. Uh, and horribly fail, just <laughs> couldn't do it. Uh, I find with a lot of Google papers that they have a lot of secret sauce um, that makes their things tick. Um, and if you don't use their secret sauce, you can't get it. So I, reproducibility in machine learning is really important. I found that out the hard way by pouring my heart and soul into trying to reproduce paper. Um, but I love the space. I mean, I, I think it's just a blast working in the reinforcement learning space. It's, uh, you know, we still had determined, haven't seen a lot of people bringing that into like a real production system or setting, mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's a fun, fun space. Well, let's talk about like what components you feel are needed to do inference in machine learning and how can we structure different models for that machine learning inference? Great question. Uh, yeah, uh, inference, and it, so I want to be clear that this varies a lot model to model, which is part of the difficult things uh, with machine learning. So funny enough, I actually think that deep learning is easier a lot of times to do inference with. Um, and that's because the nature of it working frequently on unstructured data solves one of the problems, like one of the hardest, hardest problems in uh, inference. And so what I mean by that is to do deep learning inference, a lot of times you just need to be able to instantiate the model somewhere um, and have it be able to accept data. And so, you know, instantiate the model can mean a lot of things. You generally need code that creates the model. You need uh, weights, like your trained weights to actually load them in uh, and, and potentially some other number of artifacts with something like um, you know, a language model, you might need the artifacts that actually instantiate your vocabulary and stuff like that, right? Um, and so that stuff is all easy to track with something like Determined because when you're training a model, it's like the same stuff you use to train a model ends up getting used to do inference. And so if you can, if we know how to train your model, we also, to some extent, can do the same stuff for inference. Um, but the upshot is if it's something like take an image and do inference, all you need to do is upload a plain old image and what comes back is inference. Um, I think inference gets a lot more complicated when there's a lot more data pre-processing that happens. Um, that is by far, I think, the hardest part of inference, if I had to guess. Um, it's why people rant and rave about feature stores whenever they come up. It's because, and this is that same thing we talked about before, and I think it's real, a real ML ops problem is when you have researchers that are trying out new features, they're building you know, Python code to transform their data into the perfect column that will then go into their model to build their model better. Uh, the code that transforms stuff from SQL into features here and then some Python that changes it and then you train your model and you say, hey, look, I got a great new model. Trying to take that set of things and set it up so that on live, huge scale inference data that same set of transformations happens and also trying to have like your a completely different team reconstruct that impossible impossible um and so that's a whole set of problems that i think the people tackling feature stores like power to them i hope they figure out a good way to make that scalable and find a good general solution for a lot of enterprises um and i'm glad that we're in the deep learning space and don't have to that, that it's a slightly easier easier set of problems um, so long winded delay to say, uh, in my happy little bubble, if you have your code, your weights, um, a good way to instantiate all of that, uh, you're pretty much good to go. Well, 
Tell me and forgive my ignorance on this, but I have two ideas of an ML researcher, right? One is the person that is at a university that is trying to create some crazy algorithm or some new cutting edge thing. And mm -hmm. then you have the other one and I, I kind of separate them in my head. The other one is this person that is at a company and they're trying to prove out a business value or they're researching if this is really supposed to, if this problem is going to get like fixed by using machine learning. Is that correct? Or are they the same one and the same when we talk about ML researchers? I don't think they're, they're not the same. They're like different levels of research, but I still use that shorthand of research because I, I think the core loop that a lot of people that are building ML models do looks a lot more like research in the, in the way classical sense. Um, than it does like the production move that we're used to with like a software engineering type of role. Right. Um, and I mean, like you're iterating, you're changing your code all the time. You don't commit every time, like you don't commit new code every time you make a small change to your model. You're really like dinking and dunking around until something good comes out. Right. And that feels to me a lot like, like research. And so some of, and I think that's one of the tensions when you try to push, you know, software engineering on, on that set of people is their core loop of what they're doing isn't really very similar to software engineering. Once you get over the wall and that good model exists, then it starts looking a lot like software engineering. You need to integrate it. You need to deploy it. You need with some obviously big quirks that sometimes you have gigabytes of things you're moving around and yada, yada. Right. Um, so to get back to the original question a little bit, um, those are different kinds of researchers. There's the researchers that are completely trying out new architectures. And a lot of times that is never with like, has no goal of getting to production. You don't care if you can do production, as long as you can get the metrics out. Um, uh, I've read enough repositories of that code that it's very obvious that a lot of them have no intent of ever putting any production behind that. Um, but I still think the people at the companies are doing some variety of research um, and it creates that core tension of why it can be hard to get to production sometimes. So can you talk to us about the different steps that you'll see from research to production and also the idea that you, you just said, like some code, it's never going to go to production, right? So mm -hmm. how can we prepare our code better or how can we better be ready for when we do want to get to production. Yeah. Um, I, I think there's a POC phase that happens a lot, like for everybody, no matter where, like even the most mature organizations where it's like, I see this new paper came out really promising. Like we just need to get it running against our data set. Like, can I get this running against my data set and see if it's like worth our time to invest in a completely new model to see if we can, you know, work out a few extra percent of this, uh, you know, system that we have. Um, and that's a lot of times the code that you don't care about, laid it on fire when it's done. Like, as long as you get the answer, is this worth my time or not? It's good enough, right? And then, you know, it's kind of a funnel. You get down to the, yeah, this is worthwhile. We need to, you know, think about what this is going to look like. We need to do things like, you know, distribute training to speed this up, or, or we want to do hyperparameter tuning to build a better model. And it's at that point that I think, in reality, as a ML scientist, you need to start thinking a little bit better about how you're structuring your code. Um, Determined takes a pretty opinionated stance on how you structure code. And I think it is the first, like it is that first step to moving to production. Um, you know, we ask you to literally say like, here's my model, here's my optimizer, here's how I'm loading data, as I said before, right? And that by doing that, by keeping some level of organization on your code, you're setting yourself up for success in the future because it provides like a standard that you can then translate to a production system later. Um, so talking a little bit more about development though, like a lot of times you'll see one good model come out by a whole bunch of hand tweaking or stuff like that. Uh, the next step that I tend to see is people that start wanting to retrain models all the time, right? They get new data, they're grinding out new data. They have a huge labeling team. Um, you know, they're an autonomous vehicle company that's got cars driving around. You know, the model is not tweaking a whole bunch, but data is pouring in faster than you can imagine. And so this is another thing where you want some tool to 
programmatically be able to run that training at huge scale on new data every day and, and push that result to somewhere. And this is another thing, you know, that I think something like determined really has a good role in, which is like providing the tools and APIs so that however you want to do, uh, you know, large scale recurring training, you have, you know, and that's like a super production model at that point that you're like really retraining and that sort of thing. And so um, where do you, Oh, sorry. Go for it. Nope. it. I'm just wondering where you see this, in this pipeline, where do you normally see people getting stuck? Yeah, so uh, it varies a lot on the maturity of an organization. Um, I think there is this initial thing where people get confused in this like jump from POCs to like, oh crap, I kind of need to build models that have some hope of getting production, right? And uh, there's a lot of stuff to blame. Um, there have been repositories that have come out recently or Detectron 2s and like that are, are really good and set up already for success. But if you're just going to research code and training models that way, um, like literally taking someone's research code, figuring out how to plug in your data set and go, uh, let me tell you, it's a pain to get that kind of code too. Like you need to literally rewrite a model a lot of times, right? And so, and that's not fun work. That's not enjoyable work. Like people get excited about training new models that would get excited about refactoring code, right? Um, and so I, I just think at some core, like that initial push from like, I'm in the POC phase, my goal is to show that this works to I'm in a production phase. I can still train models, but I need to do it in a somewhat reliable way where I'm using tools to track it and I'm keeping track of all my artifacts. Um, and to be clear, like this is where I think tooling can come in. Like determined tells you how to structure your model and then tracks everything for you, right? Um, same like ML flow, at least like, gives you really, really easy APIs to keep track of all of your work, like lets you have a slightly more reproducible stance on like how you're doing this stuff. And so this is one of the places where I really think there's a space for, for tooling to help bridge that gap so that when people like to help people understand what it looks like to build production ready models. Hmm. Great point. Last question I got for you, and then I'll let anybody in the chat throw what they want and ask away but i want to know once you've gotten to this maturity and you've created something we could say you're a little bit farther along this path what are things that you've seen pop up that you're not necessarily thinking about in those first phases like that poc to um just getting it out there i uh, you know i think the most well documented and one that I don't want to dwell on, but it, like it really is, it's just like your data changes out beneath you eventually, right? Always happens. Data drift is like the thing that happens to everybody's models all the time. Um, and at its core, what that means is you need to have tools to solve that in place. Um, that means downstream, you need tools to identify it happening. Like when you're, whatever you're doing for inference, you need to be able to find it quickly, address, like identify exactly what it is. Uh, it means upstream, you need to be able to figure out how to label new data, fix it, solve the problem. And in the middle with determined, you need to have the tools that when all of those pieces are firing, you can automatically really quickly retrain that model on the new data that you identified did you need to label because downstream you identified what was wrong, right? Um, and you know, I feel weird even saying that that's the thing that people don't know about because it feels like these days everybody knows about it, um, but it still bites people all the time. And it's the thing that you have to be ready for is when, you know, when shit hits the fan, how are you going to yeah, solve it's it so quickly? so important. It's so important. And I think we talk about that quite a bunch, a lot in the, in the Slack channels, and I'm a big proponent of it, especially this whole monitoring piece that it feels like, what is the way to do it? How do we go about it? It's so much more complex than just monitoring software, right? Because yeah. of the data and because of the model and you have to check for drift. And I like this idea of saying, you, if you're monitoring, you wanna be able to have a very clear path and go back and fix it really quickly rather than just monitoring, okay, drift is happening, let's be able to know where it started or why it started and get it fixed so that we don't have to suffer through that for a yeah. while without actually needing to. 
Yep. So, and you know, looking at some of the most mature organizations that understand this, the one that always comes to my mind is the autonomous vehicle companies where they see new stop signs, they see new road conditions, they see something and they have active learning setups so that while they're training, they could, they can, you know, like in the middle identify new stuff. Um, you know, they test their cars all the time to see and identify where they need to collect new data and label new data. And they have really sophisticated pipelines to quickly retrain models at huge scales, right? Um, and you know, I think they're a good beacon to look forwards of how people are really solving this issue at scale right now. I think you are muted. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> That's always uh, whatever. I see the last question coming through here in the chat and. Um, Mignev is asking, what are the most underrated topics regarding deploying machine learning models in production, in your opinion? Uh, yeah, we briefly touched on it, but the thing that I don't think people talk about enough is how hard it is to recreate your data in production. Um, as I said, I think for deep learning, we're gifted or we're pretty lucky that sometimes you can just upload an image and get an answer back. Um, when you are talking about complicated transforms before your data is ready, um, getting that to happen, you know, at all is hard. Like just recreating that set of transforms is hard, let alone recreating it in a production grade way where if you're getting data and you need it to be ready and transformed a fraction of a second later, so you can make a real time prediction, uh, I think without a doubt, that's the thing that people have the hardest time identifying, which is actually, I think the hardest part of, of this productionalization of models. Do you have a solution or are you just gonna leave us with that problem? Uh, so just feature stores are, are real. Like people, I don't think people have a, for, so I, th I think when people first think about feature stores, the thing that comes to their mind is a place where you can store all of your features and then reuse them for later. Uh, and that's a small part of the value prop, but the real value prop is providing clean pipelines to take features that you use for training and use them uh, in your downstream system. And so uh, companies out there doing that, uh, the one I think of the most is something like Tecton AI. It's relatively young, but made by the people who made Michelangelo. Uh, and then there's a couple of open, uh, Hopsworks has one that they, they market. And then uh, there's an open source offering called Feast, which is a Gojek Google collaboration. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I know Kubeflow has talked about work integrating with Feast. So those are all tools that start to try to address that problem, uh, which is a, a real hard one. For sure. So last one, I see we got two minutes left. I'm gonna try and squeeze it in here. Gonzalo is asking, in my experience, managing data science teams, usually they're not software proficient like developers. Having this in mind, how do you see the adoption of tools such as Determined and Kubeflow by data scientists? Yeah, um, I agree. I, I mean, I, I say this in full earnesty as a data scientist who probably should not be allowed to develop software um, that, that I, I completely agree. And so that's why I think determined is like a good solution for this problem. Frankly, um, you're letting me put on my sales hat for a second here. And I apologize in advance. Um, you know, we built determined to be a tool that, uh, data scientists want to use. Like they, they write in Python, they describe information about models and optimizers and like the stuff that they think about, and then they can use that to not worry about how it gets happens. Like they don't need to worry about machines and infrastructure and all of that, um, that all gets provisioned as long as they say, here's my cool model, train it on eight GPUs, and then determined goes and trains it on eight GPUs. Whereas something like Kubeflow is not like that. Like Kubeflow, if you want to train a model on eight GPUs, you've got to write a spec that's a whole bunch of Kubernetes. And um, that's not like I have yet to meet a data scientist at most organizations in the world that like is super excited to have to write a whole bunch of Kubernetes YAML to be able to train their model. And so um, determined feels like for me, fills the gap of like being an accessible for data scientist tool to do model training and stuff like that. And then, you know, 
I see it as building the right ways to hand that off to people who are software proficient, like your software leaning people who maybe aren't iterating on the coolest deep learning models, but they can talk machine learning uh, and they can use tools like our model registry to interface with the work that those data scientists are doing. And let's just finish it up here. I know that Determine does have an open source component, yes. right? Can Correct. you explain that real fast? I know yep. going uh, over a little bit, but essentially all of determined everything that I briefly showed you today is open source. Uh, you can install it, you know, right now. Uh, it's available on GitHub, determined AI slash determined, um, and essentially the whole platform. We do have an enterprise edition. Uh, it has enterprise security features and stuff like that, but none of the all of the core machine learning stuff that data scientists use that all of it is open source. So uh, easy to get going with installs on AWS, GCP, Kubernetes, on-premise, wherever you like. Wherever. Awesome. Dude, David, it's been so good talking to you, man. I really appreciate yeah. you coming here, showing us what's going on, answering these questions that I had in my mind and talking a little Kubeflow with us. Yeah, it's been fun. Really enjoyed it. Thanks for having me. Thank you, everybody, for sticking around. And if you have anything else to say to David, he is in the Slack. So get him at David Hershey. Just tag him and ask him questions. Please do. Looking forward to it.